Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. So welcome. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to the very first Keenvention. And I have to say, I really appreciate everyone who has shown up, uh, not just on time, but also early for the event. All of our panelists, our wonderful uh, legislative panel are here. And uh, so thank you to the, uh, the early bird crowd for, for coming out and helping make this event uh, a success on a, an unseasonably warm day in New Hampshire. It's t-shirt weather here at the beginning of, uh, of November, although from what I understand by the end of the weekend, it's expected to get a little bit chilly. So we should have the, the full gamut of the, uh, the spectrum here this weekend. I'm going to uh, introduce the presenter of the legislative panel. This may be the most important panel at Keenvention, which is why it's happening first. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that with, with Keenvention that we were doing something uh, that, that covers the whole gamut of activism, and the legislative scene is very busy. There are a lot of great uh, state reps who are of a liberty mindset here in New Hampshire. You just don't have that anywhere else, and you're going to have a chance to meet. Uh, there's actually one in the audience who's not on the panel. Mike Sylvia is here, so make sure you say hi to him as well, and I'm, I'm sure Seth will be introducing his wonderful panel here in just a moment. So, uh, Seth Cohn, early mover for the Free State Project, and I don't know, when what, When did you move? 2004. 2004, like one of the earliest movers. What was your mover number? 50. Number 50. So uh, thank you again for coming out to, to Keenvention. Really appreciate it. And on with the legislative panel. Here you go, Seth. Thank you, Ian. So as Ian mentioned, um, Keenvention, as I understand it, is about activism and... One of the truly amazing things about New Hampshire is that it is not only possible to do legislative activism, but it's actually um, easy. Um, it's easy to get involved at what's going on at the State House, and that's really unique. People come to the State House and are blown away by how accessible it is. Not just the building itself. The building doesn't have any metal detectors. You can walk in. Um, but you can basically walk up to a state rep and have a conversation with them. You can walk up to a state senator, have a conversation with them. That doesn't happen in other places. There are lots of other states where you're lucky if you can get an appointment with somebody's secretary and see somebody for a couple of minutes. Um, New Hampshire's legislative landscape is really unique. And my goal for putting this panel together was to sort of show that and be able to have an interesting discussion. So um, let me introduce the panelists. Um, we have the beautiful Eileen Landis, who is the chair currently of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, um, which is an organization that exists to lobby the state house in a pro-liberty manner and does an awesome job and basically has found a amazing niche over the last 10 years. Um, and she'll talk about that. We have the current representative, Tim O'Flaherty, um, a man who, um, well, let's see, he, he, I think he identifies as, a, as an anarchist some days, but he's elected as a Democrat. I'll have to talk about that. Um, and then we have the Honorable Speck Bauer, um, who he and I both served as Republicans in an amazing year. Um, in 2011, 2012, we accomplished some just astounding stuff, including cutting the state budget by a um, billion dollars. Um, and that was, a, that was huge. It, people did not believe that we were going to be able to do something like that. And SPEC is now involved in the um, Republican Liberty Caucus, as I understand it. He's also part of the HRA. Um, we'll talk about what that is. Um, so Speck is a good example of someone on the Republican side. So we've got a, a good balance here. As for myself, um, I, as I said, I was elected as a Republican. I also served at one point as the vice chair of the New Hampshire Libertarian Party. Um, I got involved with the Occupy movement. So I've been sort of all over the place. Um, I built a reputation up when I was at the State House of being sort of um, a mover and shaker, which as a freshman was, again, part of the interesting thing about the legislative landscape. You can sort of go um, from zero to 60 pretty quickly. Um, although I have to say I was involved for many, many years learning how the system worked, which is 
one of the things we're going to talk about. Um, and with that, why don't we have everybody sort of uh, talk a little bit. Um, so our focus today is legislative activism. So why don't we um, start with that as sort of a general thing. Uh, how did you get involved at the State House? What was your first experiences? And what, you know, if someone was going to walk in uh, tomorrow, what do you think would be something you'd want to pass on to them? Okay. Um, again, my name is Eileen Landis. I'm the current chair of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. I'm in my second term as chair of this amazing organization. Uh, just a quick background of New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is a all-volunteer, nonpartisan, grassroots political lobbying organization in the state of New Hampshire. And how did I get involved? Um, I think in politics here in New Hampshire, my original involvement was about six years ago with um, the vaccination choice movement. Um, I don't know if any of you are even concerned about that, but New Hampshire has a medical and religious, ex medical and religious exemption and people wanted to have a choice to say well, they're philosophically opposed. And so I worked on um, creating an organization and creating legislation and teaching people how to, how to testify, how to get into committees, what to do, um, to try to get a piece of legislation passed. So I've banked many, many hours for um, that organization that I co-founded. And just legislative activity is really getting in there and um, going to events and learning from people who are, who are already doing. Because we've, we've had people here in New Hampshire working to move legislation for 10 years. Uh, and people who are from New Hampshire who've also been working with the process. And those are those are vast storehouses of knowledge for you to go and, and get a background in. So it's easy in a nutshell. Uh, my name is Tim O'Flaherty. I'm uh, elected from Manchester. Um, I'm not afraid of the term anarchist. Um, no, I, uh, I do philosophically believe in, in anarchism, but uh, I suppose a more sanitized label would be left libertarian. Um, so my involvement in politics was, uh, at least uh, electoral politics, was, was pretty much accidental. I mean, as a testament to, to how accessible uh, New Hampshire state government is. Uh, it took two dollars, uh, put your name on the ballot, and um, I did very little campaigning and uh, found myself uh, elected. Um, Do you want to talk for a second about your primary? Because I think that's a very interesting story. <laughs> well, the, the primary, uh, I found, I forced a um, a primary when I put myself on the ballot. They weren't expecting any competition. Um, so there were, there were two seats. The Democratic Party had, had filled those seats and they thought that the, that was the end of the story. Um, I put my name on the ballot and uh, uh, managed to beat the, uh, the second uh, place candidate there uh, by the, just one vote. Um, uh, it's interesting, I was not even, I was, Assuming that I would not stand a chance, I was not even going to bother to to show up to to vote for myself, and so it's just just uh, if I had you know just decided to do something else that day, I would not have been elected. I, I managed to to go in and elect myself, um, and then because of the nature of the ward, it's very heavily democratic, and it was a, a presidential election year where Obama uh, won, so in the general election, um, victory was, was assured um, being uh, listed as a Democrat there. Uh, most people uh, are not uh, informed about, uh, at least in that ward, who, was, uh, who they were voting for. They just voted straight ticket Democrat. Um, but since then, my, my involvement at the, at the State House, uh, um, I was uh, able to pass a piece of legislation I sponsored um, uh, a nanobrewery bill this past year, um, which, uh, well, Mark Warden had the original nanobrewery bill, and then this was just a bill to allow them to um, sell pints on premises. So that will make them much more profitable. So that, that was passed and um, very sensible. A lot of people could see the business uh, um, sense behind that bill 
uh, for this next year, I have a lot more uh, uh, radical, uh, more unlikely to pass uh, bills, but it'll be fun to uh, advance uh, the debate um, in the State House on those topics. Seth said a, a couple things that reminded me of early days. He talked about accessibility of the State House, and I will always remember before I got elected, I, I went to the Secretary of State's office to get uh, the campaign finance report uh, for my opponent to be. And they pointed me to a filing cabinet and said, help yourself. I don't think there's any other state in the country where you can go look at official records without filtering through the bureaucracy. I mean, it's, I could have, I probably could have taken out hundreds of records. I certainly could have rearranged them. But, oh, there's the filing cabinet. And again, I wasn't a state rep at that time. I was just a citizen walking in off the street. And walking in off the street is something every one of you can do not just to look up a campaign finance report, uh, but to talk about a bill. The, uh, the first time I testified was uh, against a seatbelt bill. Uh, this is one of those bills. Most public hearings are held in a room, oh, a quarter the size of this. Um, but this one they knew was going to attract uh, a lot of people, so they held it in Reps Hall, which has seats for 400 people plus the gallery. I just decided I was going to testify against it. I, uh, I walked in, I signed up. In, in most states, the legislators decide who's going to testify. But in New Hampshire, every single person uh, can walk up, no advance notice or anything, just you show up uh, and you get your three minutes. And three minutes is what you're supposed to do, but I've sure seen a whole lot of people go beyond three minutes, sadly. Um, one of my early memories, uh, well, I, after I got elected in 2010, there was a meeting of the HRA, the House Republican Alliance. And uh, the HRA is, uh, is pretty liberty-minded. And it was formed about 10 years ago by a guy called Paul Mursky. Uh, and he said, we are the Republican wing of the Republican Party. Uh, he has said often that from, I think it was 2010 was the first time he really was in the majority. <laughs> <laughs> Even though Republicans had a majority for, for most of the time he'd been there, they weren't really Republicans. So he formed uh, a caucus that, you know, the, uh, as the saying goes, could have fit in a phone booth um, of like-minded Republicans who actually voted like Republicans. And that slowly grew over the years but it was still a minority of the Republican Party. And then after the 2010 election, the first HRA meeting, previous to that, they'd probably been holding it in a, in a single room, but they, they took a double room for this occasion and it was full. And I will always remember uh, the then chairman of the HRA saying, the cavalry has arrived. And we really were a majority uh, in those years. Another early memory was after, uh, pretty early in the session, uh, this was during, uh, I don't know if it was an official recess or somebody was talking and talking and talking and most of us were bored and so we went out. But anyway, I remember going out into the hall and down at the end of the hall I saw Seth and uh, George Lambert and Paul Mursky, and I think Sean Cox, was that his name? Um, and I went over to them and said, I think I see a coup d'etat brewing. <laughs> and they said, thanks. <laughs> um, 
I'll just say one other quick thing about um, early days um, and how we got involved. I, I was asked, I think five years ago, to run uh, for state rep, and I said, I don't have time for that. And the response was, if you never show up, you will vote better than the person you replace. So my plan for this panel is to sort of touch on a, a number of different things. One is what the process is like in New Hampshire um, of passing laws. And to be clear, repealing laws basically is still passing laws. You still have to pass something to repeal. Um, so that's a piece of the discussion I like to have today. Another piece is the demographics and realities of running for office, because I think everyone here has some experience with that or supporting those who do. Um, and I think that's an important piece of activism. And then the third piece, um, I would say is probably more on the how to get involved um, as quickly as possible. Um, because it's one thing to say, well, there's people up there that are doing it, uh, and we're going to touch on that as to how laws get passed. But, but I think the thing I'd like everyone to walk away with is to realize that it's a very, very um, powerful form of activism that, yes, it's going to take some time and some energy, and, and those are things that you have to be willing to commit to. But the results are huge. It is entirely possible for you as an individual, despite not being an elected official, to basically help drive a piece of legislation you care about all the way through the process. Um, and again, that's something I think really unique to New Hampshire. Uh, there are definitely bills that the only reason that they got passed is because someone made it their issue. And that someone was not someone that had a vote, that was someone who decided that they were going to be an activist and make a change happen in this state. Um, and I really want everyone that um, is here to sort of have that in the back of their head, um, especially with the rest of all the various forms of activism you're going to hear, that this is something that's definitely worth considering um, as a method of activism um, to not only do yourselves, but to also encourage other people to do. That, um, and it really doesn't matter what your philosophical viewpoint is if you go, yeah, I never vote, et cetera. You can never vote, show up at the state house and make sure that, that good things happen and that bad things don't. Um, it, it's not about believing in the process. It's about that's the process that exists and there are times that one person can make a difference in this state and, and I can think of dozens of cases where that's absolutely true. So let's start with the actual physical process. So in New Hampshire, um, twice a year, essentially, you get to submit if you are a, uh, a senator or a member of the House, and we'll talk about how big those are in a, in a moment, you get to submit a piece of legislation. So at this point, the filing period is, is done. Tim, how many bills did you submit <coughs> this time? I think the, the, final, I think the final count is about 17. Oh, 17, that's nothing. Oh, I had, that's, oh. that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> this, this man is not going to sleep from now till about, uh, oh, July. <laughs> Yeah, I, and it, um, I did uh, quite a few bills my second year, and I did get a couple of them passed. Um, and um, both Spec and Eileen are involved in tracking bills. So how many how many LSRs are there so far? Because the Senate hasn't even finished yet, right? I don't remember exactly, but I think it's around 600. So 600 pieces of legislation are potentially waiting to be heard and then voted on and well, we we usually have anywhere running between about 800 to a thousand bills every year both the house and senate together um and now one thing that to keep in mind is unlike other states every single piece of legislation gets a vote nothing ever gets stuck in committee forever mm -hmm. they can get stuck in committee and there are things that can kind of sit there for a while but essentially every single one of those items will come back to the floor of the House or the Senate and get a vote. That alone means that you don't end up with the 
Um, I don't like this bill, so I'm going to shove it in a desk drawer and it's never going to see the light of day. Um, it only takes one representative to basically force something to come to a vote. So one man, one woman makes a difference in this state by getting elected. Um, they can submit a bill, they can make sure it gets a vote, they get their time to speak on it, et cetera. Um, the, the basic process is bill gets submitted, if it makes it through a hearing, well, it's going to make it through a hearing, it's going to come to the floor, it's going to get a vote. If it passes, it then goes to the other body where the same process happens yet again, and then of course at that point it goes to the governor to be signed. That's, that's the basic process, it's just like the old uh, schoolhouse rock, I'm just a bill. Um, our process is very much like the US Congress process. Um, however, um, the sheer size of the New Hampshire House makes it a very interesting thing to get uh, bills through on the House side and the very small side of the Senate um, makes it very interesting to get things through on the Senate and they're very different. Um, so why don't we start to talk about, let's talk with the, about the House first since that's um, where we have more experience here. Well, so, sure, that's, that's easy. The, the New Hampshire State House is incredibly unique across the United States. In fact, we're the third largest English-speaking legislative body outside of Parliament. So what that translates to, we have 400 state reps in a state that has 1.32 million people. So that averages out to if somebody's really good at math, but I'm going to say 3365. about 3,365. 3,365. <laughs> I adore you, Spec. <laughs> 3,365. A New Hampshire citizens per elected official. So these truly are are people that you you can run into at the grocery store. Um, they're your neighbor. They're um, because the New Hampshire legislative body and it's in the Constitution. The legislators, the state reps, um, are almost volunteers. Not quite, but just about. Um, they make two hundred dollars for their two years of service in the New Hampshire State House. Um, free tolls. They get a license plate. If they want a fancy name tag, they got to pay for it, right? Um, Wait, and mileage get, reimbursement. You have, to pay, you have to pay for the plate. You have to pay for the plate. So their, their plate has yeah. their seat number, their, the, the section number and seat number on it. So you might see some of those as you're driving around. Um, so it's a drawer in their committee room and a locker in the basement. So um, it's. No, no, there aren't enough lockers to go well, around. You, if you're <laughs> lucky, you get a locker. If you're lucky, you Although get I have a to say, I got a locker. I never, I never used it. <clears> so. Um, so these folks are either, most people who run for state rep, they, they have a flexible job schedule. Um, they're retired, semi-retired. Um, they they're, they're, they're own their own business where they have some flexibility. Uh, they work night shift. We've, we've got a variety of things. So unlike other states where somebody's making you know, $70,000 a year and has a plush office and staff, um, the state rep here in New Hampshire is your, your, you know, we've got carpenters and lots of IT people and, and a whole realtors and a whole plethora of, of types of individuals that are in the state house. So you don't have to be of a particular persuasion to become a house member. Uh, one of the very, um, I guess the highest barrier to entry is really your uh, election. It's $2 to register or 10 signatures, is that correct? Or, or yeah, it's not many if you're part of it. We'll come, we'll, we'll come so back we'll to, come the, back to, we'll that. Come back to okay. that process. I want to talk about the, the process of, oh, sure. so you, you did a good introduction. So um, Tim, you just went through the process of submitting bills. So why don't you talk about that? And then Spec, you can talk a little bit about the committee process. Well, the, the process of uh, submitting a bill, well, first of all, it's, it's called uh, an LSR, legislative service request. You go to the uh, attorney, tell them your, your idea, They'll make it. Uh, they'll draft something up that uh, is, you know, in legalese, um, which is extremely helpful. I don't understand how it would be possible without that, because I mean, it is a citizen legislators, you know, firemen and carpenters, and so without those lawyers, I mean, that would be an impossible task. Uh, so they'll um, they'll draft that. Have you sign off? You can redraft it. Um, um, there is just a short window, unfortunately, but I suppose it's understandable considering the, ha the size of the, the, the house. It's an enormous task for, for all of these um, requests to, to go through. Um, so I have uh, 17 now, but I'm not sure that I'm going to keep all of them. Um, and also, some of them are just uh, 
technical housekeeping things. Like there's one, uh, this just adds a line, uh, the nano breweries to a, a section of law that was overlooked before. So a very, very simple thing, not, not too dramatic. Um, and then from there, they'll assign it to a committee. The speaker will um, look at the content of the bill and decide which committee it will go to. And each representative is assigned to a committee. Uh, when um, you're elected, you have a, a choice. The, what, what they did this year, um, uh, you have uh, your first, second, and third choices. And the speaker does a good job, I think, of uh, assigning you to your requested uh, committee. I requested the Criminal Justice Committee uh, as my number one pick. Um, my third pick was transportation, which is where I ended up. Um, I don't know if maybe they're wary of packing the criminal justice committee with too many libertarians. I don't, I don't know if that's part of the calculation. Um, but nevertheless, I'm on the There's transport committee. There's at least committee. three on there now. That's a pretty good list. I mean, you got Steve Valancourt, Mark Warden, and Kyle Tasker. Right there, that's three. Um, and they balance out the status on there pretty well, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, I wish there there would be more. Uh, and then the chairperson has uh, a lot of influence, and unfortunately, she she could be better on a lot of issues. Um, they killed the uh, they ITL the uh, the marijuana bill uh, just the other day, uh, which would have taxed and regulated uh, marijuana. And but but let's let's just be clear that that no other state in the nation has passed a tax and regulate bill. So why can't New Hampshire be the first? Well, well, no, it's based, this bill was based on the Colorado bill, as I understand exactly. it. Well, so. but I think what you just touched on is an interesting point. Let's move over to SPAC. We're going to talk about the committee process because you said they ITA'd the bill, but in fact, they didn't. They made a recommendation. We're going to talk about that. So, well, The first thing I'm going to do is explain a couple acronyms. ITL is inexpedient to legislate. When a bill finally comes to a vote, it's not yes or no, do you approve this bill? It's yes or no, uh, is it OTP ought to pass? Uh, or is it yes or no, that it's inexpedient to legislate? And there are a couple other possibilities, but those are the main two, OTP and ITL. So sometimes when somebody votes yes, he or she is voting for a bill or against the bill. You can't tell just from the yes or no whether it's a good vote or not. You have to know whether it's ought to pass or inexpedient to legislate. That's why you go to the NHLA and the gold standard that tells you how to vote, Smack. <laughs> Except, well, when, except when the gold standard's wrong, which does happen sometimes. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll get to that later, but as part of the legislative process, uh, you heard the first step is uh, requesting an LSR. And the list of LSRs is uh, posted on, uh, and here's an important website, GenCourt, that's the general court, dot state, dot NH, dot US. Pretty much everything you want to know about the legislature you can find on that page. And one of the things on there is a list of all the legislative service requests, the LSRs. Later, you will also find the full text of the LSRs. <coughs> the, um, the first step is for uh, the, legis uh, the legislator, rep or senate, um, to go back and forth with the LSR attorney until, to get the language satisfactory which sometimes is a lot of back and forth. But after that, when the legislator is signed off, then it goes to the speaker's office to decide, well, what committee will this bill go to? And that can often have a big effect on, whether, on the bill's chances. If it's assigned to the wrong committee, it'll end up one way or right committee a different way. Yeah, I've got a good example of that. I put in a bill to do tax credits for gardening. My goal was to encourage people to um, do gardening. Now, whether you agree with that bill or not, what happened was is that if it had gone to the agriculture committee, I had a whole bunch of people on that committee that loved the idea and would have supported the bill. But instead, because it was about town level tax credits, they decided to send it to the municipal and county committee, which 
was the absolute worst committee that year. They were just, they hated me. Um, so as a result, that bill was killed. Um, it was recommended to be killed. And um, so a lot of it does depend on where you can get it. And there were a couple of cases where by putting in the right word with the right person, you can, you can both save a bill or help to kill a bill. You go, mm -hmm. you know, this really could go to this other committee that hates it. Um, is a great way to kill a bad bill. Well, um, and there are too many instances of that. Good bills uh, killed by going to the wrong committee. Sometimes deliberately and probably more often accidentally. <laughs> um, the text of the bill, well, after the um, speaker's office and last term it was the deputy speaker who did it. Uh, then the, then it goes to the print, not office, but uh, the, the state has a printing department and they won't actually, I don't know why they do this, but they won't even put the text of the bill up on the website until it's come back from the printers. So we won't have the text of the bill uh, probably for another month and a half, maybe even into January. Um, then the chairman of that committee uh, schedules the bills and the, every bill gets a public hearing. And that's where you can have the biggest effect. If you show up at the public hearing and testify for or against the bill, that's gonna have the most influence on the members of that committee. Later, each bill has uh, an executive uh, committee meeting. Uh, the, that committee will vote and recommend to ITL or OTP the bill. Some bills go to a subcommittee um, for a little bit. A lot of our bills are really short. They, they're pretty easy to figure out. Some bills are a little longer and it takes a little bit more work to decide whether it's good or not. In some cases, um, it needs, uh, the language really has to be tightened up. And um, so sometimes in the first year, what they will do is retain the bill, which means during the summer, they'll have subcommittee meetings uh, looking at, usually at the language of the bill. At that point, they've kind of decided, well, we kind of like the idea, but there's a big difference between a good idea and a good bill. And a lot of good ideas have been killed because it was a bad bill, <clears throat> bad language for a good idea. Uh, but when they've decided it's, you know, it's probably a pretty good idea, uh, but it really needs to be worked on. Uh, and I was on at least a couple of those. Uh, I remember one in particular having to do with psychologists and we met at least a dozen times. Um, and actually the, the psychologist who was the main champion of that bill, she wrote a lot of it. <clears throat> it's, it's not always the attorneys in the state house that do it. She had her own attorneys writing stuff and brought and, it to us. And that's a really good point. We have certainly a number of, of activists who are lawyers or lawyer wannabes or just know an area really well that have helped to craft better language. And again, this is where activism can make a huge difference. You can, you might see the text of a bill and go, wait, 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 there's a really horrible consequence of this because I know this subject matter really well. And if you show up at the state house and you testify and you talk to some of these legislators, they will frequently, if you know your stuff, recognize that you are a subject matter expert and you can be that sort of influence. So again, this is where individual activism can be huge. If you've got a pet issue that you know there's a good or a bad bill going through the house, showing up makes a difference. This is not a case of you get to show up, give your three minutes and walk away. That can be, that can happen too. But sometimes you can be the person that goes ahead and makes a huge difference on what that language looks like. It's also helpful if um, one of the things that NHLA does is teach people how to review pieces of, how to review bills. And so we, we have offer bill review training. And one of the things that's helpful, if you have a passion or something you're particular in, or you really just, I want to read all the bills in criminal justice, you can go ahead and we'll train you how to read them. You can read and rate them. And so the things that are rated very, pros very high pro-liberty, very high anti-liberty get flagged. 
And so if you're able to provide us with really good bullet points um, and, and a bill gets flagged, that tells us, whoa, we need to do something about this. We'll put out um, a message on Facebook. We'll send an action alert to people, to NHLA members, to go ahead and, hey, we want to think about showing up for this committee hearing. We want to think about um, attacking this bill in committee where it's most vulnerable. So it's not just you. It's, it's you kind of pressing that red alert button through us that well, helps us rally support to kill or pass a piece of legislation. Let, let me just finish this one thing about the psychologist. After she'd gone through the process with us of getting basically her bill, uh, I think it was actually passed, she decided to run for state senate. Yes. So I don't know whether that was frustration with the process or because she enjoyed the process so much, but uh, you too, you, you show up and you testify at a committee hearing, who knows, a couple years later, you'll run for state rep. Well, and sometimes you have to get involved to get your pet issue through. I spent a number of years trying to get um, open source legislation through, and it wasn't until I actually got elected that I was able to get a bill through. It took quite a lot of work. I spent two years getting that bill passed because it got held on to for the first year. Um, so part of the second year was spent making sure that it got all the way through the process. But in fact, uh, by the time I was there, I had already been through two other versions of this bill in previous years. I knew what the uh, opponents were going to say. I knew who some of the players were. Um, it, it was not a, gee, I went and put a bill in and got a pass. This was multiple years of work. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, she's, she's certainly not the first person who got involved at the state house and got addicted to it. Um, as um, my mentor, uh, the Honorable Don Gorman, um, who taught many of us a lot of stuff, uh, is fond of saying that um, the game of politics is a very addictive game. Um, you get involved and you just keep wanting to come back because there, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of frustration, but it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, so, all right, so let's let's move on here. So so basically the idea is, is that the bill has gone to committee, has gotten a recommendation to kill or to pass the bill, and now it goes to a vote in the House. Um, it might go as part because of the overwhelming vote, it might go on to something called the consent calendar where they just bundle a whole bunch of bills that they think are no-brainers, that they're just going to vote up or down in mass. But it only takes one rep pulling that bill off and saying, I want to vote just on this issue. So um, at that point, um, let's say it's scheduled for a vote on a particular House day, and uh, let's go from there. So Eileen, what would you be doing on that House day? Well, one of, one of the things that NHLA does is we provide um, legislators with a cheat sheet of sorts that we've deemed the gold standard. It's our signature document, and it's this on bright goldenrod paper and the calendar. So we know what bills are coming up for a full house vote um, on Thursday for the following Wednesday. Sometimes a little bit more in advance as well, but it's usually Thursday for the following Wednesday. And as Seth said, bills are either gonna go on consent calendar or called regular calendar. And so we know, we'll look, we, we read through all the bills on the regular calendar and go, which ones have a clear liberty impact? Which ones you know, have been rated in bill review as high impact, low impact, or, or some, you know, somewhere on the, the edges. And so we will go ahead and provide key bullet points for the legislators and say, here's this piece of legislation, here's what the committee wants you to do. Um, and they vote on the committee recommendation, not on the bill, they vote on the recommendation of the committee. That's something that people have to really keep clear. And we will say, this is how we want you to vote from a nonpartisan liberty perspective. And so we give key, you know, constitutional points, um, and we have the 2010-2011 biennium, we had a 78.6% success rate on our recommendation. So it's not every bill, the HRA does every bill, but the gold standard, we do just the bills that have a key um, true liberty aspect. Well, and actually, since you mentioned it, so Spec, do you want to talk about the HRA uh, pink sheet for a second here to compare? So this is one of the interesting things. We don't only have one cheat sheet. sheet. There's multiple <laughs> cheat sheets. No. But ours is the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because we're not as a rep, 
I, I looked at all of these. I looked at the HRA pink sheet, the NHLA gold standard, and Cornerstone occasionally made a recommendation. RLC made some recommendations. Since I was already liberty-minded, I was looking at these recommendations to see if the recommendation was right, not to see, not to influence myself. Um, and they were usually right. Uh, occasionally, Pink Sheet was wrong, and occasionally, the gold standard was wrong, but uh, they, they usually agreed with me. And it was the most fun when they disagreed with each other. Yeah. And then you were kind of like, well, wait, they're, they're both making it. good arguments sometimes. Yeah. And, and yeah, um, it, it was very interesting that year yeah. that we had really yeah. very strong yeah. arguments on both sides. Yeah. And that's typically mm -hmm. true. There's a lot of people that put a lot of time and energy into reviewing what these things are and saying, hey, uh, well, one of the points is is that the 400 reps, most of them, except for the ones that are on the committee, know nothing okay, about no, this yeah. bill until that day because there's so many bills and they're not in that area. And again, this is a case of you have people that are looking for guidance and if you make that sound argument in a nice sound bite, yep. you, can, you can influence their vote on that same day mm -hmm. too. And, and so on Wednesdays before house session, I'm standing up there with our copies of the gold standard. I could always use additional volunteers mm -hmm. to be up there on house days, passing them out to the state legislators. So they'll, they'll typically come by to be sure they get a gold sheet. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, we have, a, we have a good solid reputation up in Concord and it's just taking a, taking the NHLA, well, I think we started with the gold standard back in 2005. So it's taken us several years to get to the place where we're a respected document, we're a respected mm -hmm. organization, because we're very, very consistent with the, with the liberty arguments we put forth. But in f the, the practice is that despite all these recommendations, the pink sheet, the gold sheet, and whatever, they don't affect the result very often. Um, and, the, and that's the sad truth, that most committee recommendations get passed. The committee says kill it, the committee says pass it. Most of the time, the House does what the committee recommends. When it's really fun yeah. is when we overturn a committee recommendation. I think the last biennium, there were 13 something, Yes. Uh, each each, each oh, year, there are roughly 13. We days. had a huge number, way more than yeah. average, because of the interesting political machinations of that particular makeup. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of things where the committee recommendation was the typical, this is the way politics works. And the problem was is that the house makeup was not the typical the way politics mm -hmm. works. So we were turning over a lot of things. Um, Tim, well, so let me, let me yeah, finish uh, up uh, on that. Sure, if I may. sure. Um, I, I heard it said that uh, we overturned more recommendations than other uh, longer reps had seen in, in a dozen years, and I believe it. But the reason I mention that is that the recommendation on the day of the floor vote doesn't make much difference. What really helps is getting involved earlier in the process. Getting in the committees. Go to the public hearing, uh, write to, or, or speak in person. Um, a lot of you will bump into your state rep at the supermarket or the post office uh, or pick up the phone. I mean, it's, in most cases, now, now Keene being one of the larger areas, I, even though we're, it's split into five, uh, uh, section, so it's probably only two or three reps each one. Um, so m most of you have just two or three reps, um, and good chance you know your rep. But uh, before the committee makes its recommendation is your best chance to influence a vote. So we're in the HRA this year, and I, I wish we'd done it two years ago, but we learned. Uh, we're looking at the bills when we have the list of LSRs, then we're looking at the bills uh, when we have the text, and before uh, the hearing, because again, at the GenCorp website, you can look uh, at the calendar, either you can look at what's called the calendar, or you can look at the, um, what, what I do is probably a little out of the ordinary, but I download the entire legislative, uh, uh, tables um, <clears throat> and <coughs> excuse me 
on my computer, I can manipulate them and look farther in advance than if I wait for the calendar to come out. So I sort them by um, the date of the scheduled committee hearing. And so two weeks before a public hearing, I know there's gonna be a public hearing and we started mobilizing troops that early. And I think we were much more successful this year because instead of waiting until the floor vote, we uh, got involved before the public hearing and before the uh, uh, exec sessions of the committees. So Tim, why don't you talk for a couple minutes about what it's like to be on the floor since you uh, have, have the honor of doing that this year. Um, and then uh, we've got about 10 more minutes. So um, what I'm thinking at that point is we'll talk a little bit about um, electoral politics in this state because I think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind especially if you don't currently live here and it's something you're interested in is to understand that where you move etc makes a difference so we'll, we'll we'll finish off with that but why don't you talk a little bit yeah, and, and actually if you want to talk about your interesting circumstance here <laughs> um, well just to touch on um, the overturning the committee recommendations um, in this past uh, year I mean the, it, Liberty activists uh, a couple of times uh, overturned uh, committee recommendations. Um, uh, Joel Winters, early in this session, uh, was instrumental in overturning a committee report. Um, pulled it from the consent calendar, uh, uh, this bill that would have increased the pay of uh, state legislators at a meeting at the accounting convention. Um, so uh, this underscores that most, most legislators aren't aware of what's um, what the bills are, um, consent calendar, um, bills can just fly through. But he uh, pulled that off, overturned the committee report, and uh, no one was willing to vote for a pay increase. Uh, they didn't want to see that on their record. And also he was instrumental in uh, overturning the committee report on uh, decriminalizing uh, small amounts of marijuana. So um, just being there and paying attention to the consent calendar puts you uh, uh, in, the, in the lead. Um, um, I did uh, have an opportunity to, to speak on the, on the House floor a couple of times. One uh, was uh, kind of impromptu regarding um, uh, the in ignition interlock device, breathalyzer device, um, but still I was able to you know, uh, make, a, make a point that this is a violation of privacy, which uh, unfortunately uh, wasn't persuasive um, and it still passed. Um, and then the second time um, was to try to resurrect the um, a bill that would have prohibited uh, the state of New Hampshire or any of its agents from um, cooperating with the uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, so this had passed with the overwhelming support earlier, uh, but then it died in the Senate committee uh, unfairly, I feel. Um, it got an unfair hearing there. Uh, the National Guard sent a letter to the Senate committee uh, which wasn't uh, made available to the, the public at that committee hearing, apparently. Uh, I was able to uh, obtain a copy of that letter, and the objection, although it was reasonable, uh, was easily overcome. The Senate committee, well, the Senate in general has an attitude that, that they're the grown-ups, and they'll just, they'll just you know, kill any, any bill that, that seems a little too ambitious. Um, they're not willing to spend the time to, to fix something, and I've, they just weren't will, willing to question the, the National Guard. The National Guard came out against it, so instantly killed the bill, but this, this bill has merit. Uh, what I tried to do was attach it as an amendment to another bill that the Senate wanted passed through the House, and um, that ruffled some feathers, uh, um, but I was, I was able to um, um, give a defense, you know, that uh, New Hampshire does not uh, stand for indefinite detention. Uh, I've attached this to a, a bill honoring uh, veterans. So I was able to make the argument that if you, if you want to do more than, uh, if you want to honor veterans, you can do more than just issue a simple license plate. You can actually, you know, defend the, the liberties that, that they're, you know, fought and died for. Um, that, that got a lot of, um, support from some uh, Republicans. Uh, so they gave some impromptu uh, uh, floor speeches there, um, but it needed some more Democratic uh, support in order to pass. And what, what that experience taught me is that the Democrats in the House um, are, are a tight group. Um, I, I, would, I would 
go for, so as far as saying that that um, perhaps there's a, a lot of uh, they're lemmings, perhaps. Uh, they, want, they want to follow, don't want to step out of the line of the party leadership. And that's, that's unfortunate. I don't see that same kind of thing in, in the Republican uh, side of the House. Um, a lot of Democrats were supportive of um, my effort to um, send the NDAA bill back to the Senate, but they didn't want to um, step out of line with party leadership. Uh, but but there is the opportunity to, to bring the issue up uh, again uh, next year since it did pass the House. So hopefully um, it'll fare better uh, next year. So you kind of touched on the one area we didn't. So, so let's assume that the bill that we're hypothetically discussing here passes the House, then it goes to the Senate, and the whole process starts all over again. It gets assigned to a Senate committee, and there is a Senate hearing. And the big difference is, is that the Senate is made up of 24 individuals, and typically to run for a Senate seat is about a $100,000 minimum. We're gonna talk about how much it costs to run as a house rep um, to give you the comparison. But if you can make a sound argument and you can get a bill through the Senate, then at that point you have uh, most of the time successfully gotten a bill passed. Occasionally the governor will veto something, um, as happened to me a couple of times. Um, and then you have to basically make the argument all over again and hope that everybody's willing to stand up against the governor, which doesn't often happen. Uh, occasionally it does. Uh, so, again, we kind of touched on all the places where an individual can make a difference. We've talked, touched upon places where it makes more of an influence or less of an influence. So you could right now, basically this coming year, walk into the state house and help to influence bills. But if you really want to be part of the process, you go to get elected. So, Spec, um, how much time did you put in on the redistricting um, to just as, as a rough guess? I don't have the foggiest idea. I, I think it was, for probably about a month, it was every night for several hours, and it was mostly at that stage, Seth and I were going back and forth trying to one-up each other. Uh, some He was actually on the committee. I was just a person who liked playing math puzzles. Um, uh, what we're talking about is that we just went through in uh, the, the last two years a redistricting where it rearranged where these house seats were. Um, and the reason that's important is that depending on where you are, um, you may have one seat, two seats, five seats. Um, you may have a floating area that's a, a bigger district. All of that affects the races that we're talking about running. Um, so for instance, Spec, what's your, what, when you ran the last time, what, what, how many seats were there? In my district? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, when I first ran, it was a, a one town, one rep district. Not a whole lot of those, but uh, when we did the redistricting, we actually tripled the number of uh, one town districts. Uh, it's, I don't know, something like 60 or so one-town districts, but the districts tend to be fairly small uh, in, in geography and in population. Um, when I ran originally, I was part of a six-town, it was a pretty big district. It was six reps covering six towns. Um, that got broken up. Um, and it actually made it harder for me, um, and that's actually one of the reasons I didn't run again, was that I looked at the demographics of my town, and I said I would have a really hard time running, and I looked at the commitments and everything else, and I said, I need to pay my bills, um, and I need a break from politics. Um, I like to say I'm a recovering politician, which means I don't go to meetings. Um, so, Tim, you're in a Manchester ward of two, that's right. It used to be three, but I, I suppose in the redistricting, it was they eliminated one of the positions, so it's just two now. Um, it's about nine thousand um, uh, people, so uh, that that uh, three thousand figure might not apply to my ward. Um, but my ward is a little unusual, though. Um, that the number thirty three sixty five applies to every district plus or minus five percent. Uh, you have two in your district, plus you have what's called a floaterial, and nobody wants to know about floaterials. 
<laughs> so, Eileen, you want to talk a little bit about the NHLA um, process for helping candidates out? Um, sure, I can talk about that. One of the things that NHLA does, in addition to um, try to help get people into committees and, and grassroots activism, is we want to help people get elected, pro-liberty-minded people. So we, um, we recruit candidates for office, and we help train you. So we, what training would entail is just giving you a basic idea of what it looks like to run for state rep. As we were talking, you just depending on the size of your district, it could be one town or it could be six, six towns, so it's a little bit more money needed there. We know that people have run and won elections with as little as $500 for state rep. Um, I'm trying to think in one of the bigger districts, which is Goffstown, Ma Mark Warden, who moved there shortly before then, he he looked to see where it would be a good place to live and, and picked Goffstown and um, spent about $2,500 for his election in 2010, and he had some great signage, and he was able to win his election, and he really didn't have to spend a whole lot more when he ran again in 2012 because he already had the signage. So I think that election maybe maybe cost him $800. So there was a huge difference for the investment up front for the first time he won. And once you're in, it's a lot easier to get reelected into office. So it's very doable for a state rep. Um, New Hampshire's is different. That people like to actually talk to you. And so there's a, you, you get um, Laura uh, Jones, for example. She was in a primarily um, Democrat-leaning district, but she was determined to go door to door. And so she wouldn't go home she went to 100 doors that day. So she went door to door introducing herself and passing out literature and so she ended up winning her election and she's in her second term now, um, very, very um, hard campaigner. So it is very, very doable um, and if you're interested in running for state rep, you need to have been a resident of the state of New Hampshire for two years. So that's the test for Senate at seven and so there actually are some very pro-liberty-minded individuals who've been here long enough to consider running for Senate. Um, but it costs a yes. lot more. It's a much bigger race. It's, it's yeah. a lot harder. So the Senate is really the next plateau oh. that the liberty movement needs to reach um, to start electing more pro-liberty senators. But um, we're not quite there yet. That's yeah. my opinion. Well, um, well, we also, NHLA, in addition to help training, we also have a PAC. So in addition to help providing you, you with um, time and with volunteers to try to, because we put out a list of our endorsed candidates. Um, we have a survey if you've not run for office and we rate you on your survey and if you score high enough, then we're willing to put you on our endorsed candidate list. If you're an incumbent and you've got a great score, then we'll endorse you um, as well for the next election. And so we'll send you out a check. Um, if you're thinking of running for office and, and um, we, we can also look at where your demographics are and say, mm, it might not be a good place for you to run for office under as a Republican, better as a Dem, or, or vice versa. So we, we have the, that data with us as well to help people really know the best area for them to run for office. Let me think what else. We um, occasionally in key races, like the last election, there were about 22 key districts where they were very, very, very close, and we sent them second round checks. So. Getting a check for 100 bucks doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're looking at a budget of $1,000, that's that's 10%. That's a lot of money. So um, that's one of the. So if you if you aren't running for office or you can't consider running for office, there's always donating to the NHLA PAC. If I can win, anybody can win. <laughs> yeah, I think $500 is. I mean, I I had the endorsement of the NHLA and a hundred dollars and I bought myself a, a sign and some flyers one yard sign that I stood at the pole and you know to make some effort but that was that was the um, the maximum amount that I that I spent and very little effort uh, and you don't have to um, take it very seriously you can have fun with it I mean it's it's possible to I mean run an irreverent campaign and and still and still um, get yourself elected and, and also um, operate, maybe not uh, as successfully as some other people, but uh, operate in the, uh, in the state house. Oh, one of the things I almost, I almost forgot to mention, because I see him sitting right here, is, is just simple write-in. Occasionally there's not a candidate 
running um, in your district under the, a party, and you just write yourself in, and so you're a sure vote. Um, New Hampshire's um, demographics, you've got about 30% that are hardcore registered Democrats, about 30% that are hardcore registered Republicans, and there's that giant 40% in the middle where you have really don't know where they're going to swing to. So at least if you... Like like Mike again um, as a, as a write-in, you 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 know you got thirty percent of those voters right away. So um, yeah, and there's you can a, save two dollars, and you can save two dollars. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because we really are that much of a cheap state, um, and it, I think that's really important for people to realize is that this is a state where electoral politics is um, very popular. Uh, we have the first in the nation primary. People are used to politics being a point of discussion. Um, there's an old joke that says, um, I'm not sure who I'm voting for for president. I've only met them all twice, and one of them's coming over for dinner next week, but I'm still not sure who I'm voting for. Um, and and the, the truth is, is that we have a population that, despite a number of people that are very much involved, a lot of people... Um, get sick and tired of politics. They find it refreshing when somebody gives them honest answers. So you can, in many cases, run, as you said, an irreverent campaign because there are people that will go ahead and respect you for that. Um, you will find that New Hampshire's electoral scene is interesting. That's the best way I can put it. Um, it's fun. Um, it's you will have to get out. Uh, it looks like this year, and we'll see what happens on Tuesday, it looks like election day this year, which um, this is an off year, so um, election on Tuesday are mostly at the city level. Um, it usually cycles back and forth between the statewide races and the towns, and then the, the, the city offices are in the other one of those two years. Um, Typically, November is rainy, it's drizzly, sometimes it's got snow. Um, that's actually a huge day for activism. Um, if, if you say, you know, I don't have the time to go to the state house, but I really want to help somebody else get there, if you commit that you are going to hold a sign for somebody on election day, that alone is huge. You put in one day, once a year, and you will have people that will be competing to get you to the polls. They will make sure you get fed in many okay. cases. <laughs> yeah, they'll feed you, they'll provide you with coffee or whatever you need um, to get you to, to come and hold signs. That's, that's, that's a huge thing. And we have, um, this is one of the first times that I recall that NHLA has endorsed um, city level candidates. So we do have on our website um, a list of civil, um, um, city level candidates that are endorsed by our organization. So we've created a separate survey for that. Um, Spec was, I, I wanted to jump in there. Spec was putting the Gen Court website. Ours is a lot easier. It's nhliberty.org. And when you go to um, New Hampshire Liberty Alliance website, nhliberty.org, we have all of these wonderful links that you just, you want to go to the house calendar, you want to go to uh, look, re, um, look up a bill, you want to look at the calendars, whatever you want to do with regard to the Gen Court. You want to look up an RSA. Um, it's all right there on our website and all the links to that's easy. So nhliberty.org. Just don't try nhla.org. It's no, <laughs> nhliberty.org. NHLA is the New Hampshire Lama, Lama Association. Which one is that one? There's a, but there's a number of them. I think it's Legal Defense Association, something like that. <laughs> but it's, not, it's the wrong thing. And actually, Eileen mentioned another acronym that not everybody knows. RSA is Revised Statutes, Statutes Annotated, annotated which, is, which is basically the laws. All of the laws currently are called RSAs. They didn't used to be. They've actually gone through various names over, and the current ones are called RSAs. Um, so when someone says RSA, you know, 647... Dot three colon seven. They're talking about a specific law that's on the books, and there's actually there's way too many laws on the books. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so we've got ten minutes left. Um, I'd like to go ahead and take some questions. I'm sure there's people who've got questions. Um, we've got a mic set up, I believe. So if you want to get up and go for the mic, that'll probably be the easiest to make sure that we get it recorded. I'm Alvin C. Soon to move to Keene. Uh, question for you is how bills start. Does everything start in the House or can the Senate originate bills or the governor? 
the governor can't. The Senate certainly can. There are certain bills that have to start in the House in the same way that in Congress, like money bills are supposed to start in the House. And I believe in New Hampshire, it's the same way that there are certain bills that are supposed to start in the House. Just okay. the budget. Just, Just the budget, budget, actually. Yes, the budget. And the but, and so New Hampshire, for the most part, is against the idea of yeah. um, what they call non-germane amendments. You know, the, the Congress is full of those where they tack things on. It does happen in New Hampshire, but it's usually frowned upon. Um, so most of the time, you can't take something that's unrelated. Tim brought up a good example. He attached the NDAA bill to a veterans bill, and that's because there was a little bit of similarity to it. Um, occasionally it happens. There's no law forbidding it, but it's very much frowned upon. So it typically is, you know, single subject matter and typically, um, there, as I said, like the budget is a good example where there, there, things do get attached to the budget. The budget is, is massive. Um, and there's, uh, you want to talk about people that work unceasingly, it's the people on finance. They're huge. It's, a, it's like a double-sized committee. They break up into three sections and they deal with a budget, which at this point is something like 12 billion, 13 billion. 10.3, and, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, in 2011, 2012, we do a budget for two years, and it's always ahead of the curve. Um, we managed uh, to cut a billion dollars from the budget. It was um, 11 point something percent. I yeah, it was, it, was a, it was quite a big chunk. All right, thank you. Hello. Um, you've mentioned a lot of things that you can find on the internet various places. Can each of you tell us one thing that you find most interesting that we won't find on the internet until this video is posted? Uh, okay, let's see. Something interesting. Um, one of the interesting things about the New Hampshire State House is the accessibility. Um, it is an awesome building with um, tons of rooms and I will tell you that just being in that building and wandering the halls and talking to people is an education unto itself um, and it, actually I will say that um, getting elected is probably one of the best ways to learn about the state. You will learn on whatever subject matter you're on, on the committee, you will learn about how New Hampshire works in that area and it is a amazing education. I served on, and I respected as well, the, um, uh, the pension committee. And I learned more about how the state's public pension system works than I ever wanted to know. And um, that was an education. I was actually getting paid to do it. It was only $100 a year, but um, you learn a lot. It, it, that I think is is sort of an unknown secret. So really, I think my point is that the state house is just a fount of all these little things that you sit in a committee and you learn stuff and you go, why haven't I ever read that or heard that? You will see a lot of things um, just sitting there, even if you're not a rep, you'll hear stuff and go, oh, I, I, I learned that, yeah. I guess an interesting thing is that um, Seth had mentioned earlier that we don't have any metal detectors. So um, there are no laws regarding um, <coughs> firearms in the state house. There's only a rule. And so that rule sh seems to be changed. It was changed for a while. In 2010, it was changed to allow firearms. And so it's, it's for the legislators, I believe, is the rule currently because many people I know of who go to um, inside the state house are concealed carrying. I think there's a whole lot of don't ask, don't tell. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of don't ask, don't tell. But it's a rule, it's not a law. So the people have a misnomer that they passed a law saying you can't carry a, a weapon into um, the state house, that's a rule. Well, the rule only affects the, the chamber, uh, yes. but there's, there's a question about if it affects the gallery or not. Um, yes. So. Right, I mean, maybe that's a point for some activism. I, I don't know if uh, someone wants to obviously carry into the gallery or see, what, see just what would happen. I, that could I be a little let's sensitive. Not, let's, it's let's been done. I recommend that. All right, moving on, <laughs> moving on. Um, I will just echo what, what Seth said um, about the, uh, it being an education. It's, it's like going to Statist University. Um, 
I mean, earlier he said he enjoys it, that it's fun, and I, I really can't say that I enjoy it. It's, it's not fun for me, um, but it's, it's worth doing. Now, my experience there, um, it really turns my stomach every time I'm there. I, it's extremely frustrating, but it's still worth doing for the, the educational value of it, and um, just to be able to, to voice your opposition to the, the state, it's an invaluable experience uh, to be able to do that on the floor of the House of Representatives. The sausage making is really ugly, and it does turn my stomach too, Tim, so I completely <laughs> understand what you're talking about. Let's move on. All right. So, All right, so I actually have a question for each of them individually. Speck, you mentioned something about the Republican wing of the Republican Party. For those of us that have never been Republicans and don't ever plan on being a Republican, what does that even mean? We do have a platform. And the reason Paul Mursky formed the HRA is that he found vote after vote after vote was not consistent with the platform. And so he decided the definition of a Republican is voting in accordance with the platform. Now nobody's, well very few will get 100%. Some of us got pretty darn close to that. But uh, uh, so he simply, um, he created the pink sheet uh, Recom uh, recommendation on each bill was based upon something in the platform. And if the platform did not say anything about that particular issue, then the HRA does not make a recommendation. Uh, so in the beginning, um, there were very few roll calls. So you, it was kind of hard to judge how people were going. So he started asking for more and more roll calls. So then there was information as to how people voted, whether they were voting consistently with the Republican platform or not. And that's uh, how the HRA process uh, began and continues. Okay, and a question for Tim. Uh, thankfully, you were one of the few people that voted to uphold the right of individuals to petition the legislature for redress. And I've noticed that Emily Sandblade has filed an LSR that is relative to petitions for redress. Uh, do you plan on supporting that, possibly co-sponsoring? Yeah, I uh, would consider co-sponsoring that. I have to take a look at it, but um, yeah, I would have uh, no problem doing that. I believe you also have a bill about uh, making it easier for um, uh, third parties. And, yes. And I'd be happy to, to co-sponsor that as well if, once that comes out of the uh, uh, drafting phase. I'll take a look at it. And my question for Eileen, you keep mentioning the $2 filing fee to run for state rep, uh, but you never specify that that's only for people that wish to call themselves Republicans or Democrats the process for third party and independent candidates is much more difficult. Uh, do you plan on ever actually telling people that there is a process to run as something other than a Republican or a Democrat? Or does the NHLA only want people running as a major party? Um, well, that's a tough one to answer. Well, the, the, the reality here in New Hampshire is running as a rep in a third party will not get you elected. You, you, the, the probability uh, of under you the winning current election, process. Under, under the current process, the probability for um, getting elected under a third party, you're more likely to be struck by lightning. And so, if if we're if we're looking to really make a difference and try to get people elected, it's picking either an R or a D after your name. I'm, I'm sorry to have to say that. And just a quick follow up: you are aware that Vermont has had the same ballot access law since they instituted ballot access. And they actually have third party candidates in their legislature and independents. Daryl, I will tell you that as somebody who worked really hard to get ballot access, it is an uphill battle, unfortunately, because the two parties are there and they do not want to change the game. Um, and I wish that was different and I'd like to see it change. Um, but reality is, if you want to be effective, you have to go with the tide, and fighting the tide means you get exhausted just swimming against it. All right, we'll um, take one more question. To what extent have authoritarian transplants from neighboring states pulled local governments and the state government in an authoritarian direction? 
Um, well, actually, that's a great question. Um, and actually, I think Speck and I, having looked at the demographics when we did the redistricting, um, the traditional view has always been that the southern states, uh, southern towns rather, um, which you would think would be more influenced by being near Massachusetts and having people who cross over the border and move into New Hampshire, would actually end up voting more statist. Uh, the funny thing is, is that that really isn't true. Um, what we found from having to really look at voting, we, when we spent a lot of time working on redistricting, we looked at voting histories of the various towns on a town by town basis, on a vote by vote basis, year after year after year, and basically did an assessment to figure out which towns are gonna vote which ways. The problem is not the transplants. The problem is the educational institutions. If you drew circles around where the state universities are, the university systems, it, it, and, and the colleges, now you could say, yes, students are an influence on that, but I, I'm gonna tell you that it's a systemic problem that is spread around the state quite a lot more than people would think. It's not necessarily people moving from other states, it's people that are part of a culture that believes that um, social planning um, can be done by a, a, an elite group of people and they have been taught that <laughs> um, and they vote that way. Um, I'm not gonna say that we have a, a voter ID problem. I'm not gonna, I, I think I'm still on the fence on that one. I think there's arguments that could be made either way. But I will say that if you look at the demographics of this state, you can find places where tons of people have moved from other places and they still will consistently vote in a pro-liberty manner. Well, I, I think when you were looking at the redistrict thing, I think that you were primarily looking at uh, voting on the state level. But I think some of those towns, if you were to look at their tax base on a local level on how they're voting, they're voting much more statist at a local level than they are voting on, on a ticket. Uh, for example, uh, for, I, I can think of Bedford, for example, they didn't have a high school and when eventually they got to a point where they voted for a high school and, and there's the tax base there has so on the local level. institutions, is, I'm telling you, it's the educational institutions. institutions. So, so that's a little bit different at a local level. So they may be voting um, more liberty minded for state elections, but on the local things where the, all the tax dollars base, they, it might not necessarily be the case. So we're running slightly over, so I want to give everybody a last chance. Has anybody got anything else they want to add here? Um, I'd just like to comment quickly on the previous question about two parties and so on. I think the only way we're going to get really strong third parties if, is if we pass approval voting. Um, Agreed. And we don't, I don't have time to explain it, and you guys may already know what that means. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that the um, NHLA will be hosting two um, sessions, one in November, I think November 20th, and one December 11th on testimony training up at the Legislative Office Building. Um, please um, look at our Facebook page, go to our website. I don't think it's up on the website yet because we're still finalizing some of the details. But we'll be offering testimony training on November 20th and December 11th. So if you are able to find your way up to Concord on those days, it would be well worth your time. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Ian, Thank for you. giving us this awesome opportunity to have a panel. And uh, with that, we will... Say good, good morning. <laughs> We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.